A 20-year-old man would vanish after a poker party and has never been seen since. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Josh Guimond. Viewer discretion is advised. Josh Gimon was born on June 18th, 1982, and he was the only child to Brian Gimon and Lisa Cheney. He spent most of his life growing up in Maple Lake, Minnesota. Josh was always a people person, very friendly, very outgoing. He had a big group of friends. He had a very, a big personality. He was someone who everybody looked at throughout school as like, this is the guy who is most likely to succeed out of all of us. And he had big aspirations. He wanted to attend law school and he was actually on his way to doing that. He wanted to become a successful lawyer, maybe open his own practice. And then eventually he wanted to find his way into politics, whether it be starting as a senator or just go straight to being president of the United States. And by all accounts, everybody that knew him, even people that only kind of knew about him or just saw, you know, saw him at school, said that he was certainly going to be that person um, much later on in life. He was funny. He was charming. Uh, he was uh, super handsome, athletic. He, when he graduated high school, he was that, uh, the school's valedictorian at that point. Um, he gave a big speech at his graduation. And in that speech, it kind of just demonstrated more how confident he was, how studious of a person he was, how intelligent uh, that he was. From the outside looking in, nobody looked at Josh and said, oh, this guy's got problems, or this guy has enemies, and ah, oh, this person hates him. Like, there wasn't any of that. He was just a, a, a good, normal guy living his life. He started dating uh, Katie Benson in high school. They were high school sweethearts. And for a time there, they were very much in love with each other. They would end up going to different colleges technically, but they were like in the same area. So they actually shared classes together. Josh was attending St. John's University, which is in Collegeville, Minnesota. He was majoring in political science at that time. And then from there, the plan was for him to enroll in some kind of uh, high level law school. But unfortunately, that never got to come for him. A few weeks or so, I think, leading up to this case, Josh and Katie had broken up. It seemed to be a pretty amicable breakup. They remained really good friends. Like Katie would say, Josh was her best friend still. Josh had a roommate um, named Nick and I, there was a, Nick knew Katie as well. The three of them were, you know, good friends. There was a point where there was this will they or won't they between Nick and Katie, but this was after Katie and Josh had broken up. Nick would say that, you know, he and Katie had shared a kiss or two, but in terms of a romantic relationship, that was never something that was going to be destined to occur. But he and Katie remained good friends as well. Josh at that point had become the treasurer of the pre-law school society. He was also on, he was the co-captain of their mock trial team. So like I said, Nick and Josh were roommates. They lived in an on-campus apartment. Uh, it was called the St. Maurer House. On November 9th, 2002, uh, Nick would tell police later he and Josh had gone to brunch that afternoon. They got back to their apartment. Josh was doing a lot of work on his computer in his room. And then at some point, Katie invites them to a get together that was gonna be happening later that night. Nick says, yep, I'll absolutely go. Josh, at first, I think, agreed to go to that party, but then he was given an invitation to another friend's get-together. They were having, like, a poker night, and so Josh said he was going to go to that. So at about 7 p.m., Nick uh, and Josh were at the apartment, but then Nick left the apartment. He remembers saying goodbye to Josh, um, have fun at the poker party, because, you know, Nick was going to Katie's, uh, and that will be the last time that Nick said he ever saw Josh ever again. At approximately 11 p.m., Josh would leave his apartment and was going to be heading to the poker party, which was at the Metancourt Apartments. 
which was across, I guess, this lake or pond from where he lived on the campus to where the apartments were. Later on, they would determine that Josh used his apartment key card to access the apartment at 11.06 p.m., just shortly after he had left the apartment. He had gone back in because he had some beers in there that he forgot that he wanted to bring. So this is relevant because the key card will register any time you use it to scan into, into the building. And so 11.06 p.m. was the last time it was ever used for Josh. So Josh, along with a couple of his friends, would walk over to the Metancourt apartments to the poker party. Everyone there said Josh was in his normal, happy-go-lucky mood. He was mingling, he was talking, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, no signs of anything going wrong. He was joking with everyone, you know, making people laugh. He was drinking alcohol, and some people would later tell police that it appeared to them that Josh was intoxicated but other people would say that Josh did not appear to be intoxicated. So a lot of mixed and conflicting reports on that. At approximately between 11.45 p.m. and midnight, a couple of the party goers said they would see Josh stand up from one of the poker tables and walk towards what they assumed was the bathroom. The bathroom and the front door of the apartment were in the same direction. And the majority of people who saw this kind of just saw it in their peripherals. They weren't really thinking about it and they didn't really notice for sure if it was Josh or not, or you know, what direction exactly he went in the apartment. Nobody can say they saw him physically open the apartment door and walk out. People were distracted, they were talking, they were having fun. It was, again, all happening just kind of in their peripherals. About 15 or 20 minutes later, there were some people that Josh had gone to the party with that noticed that they didn't know where Josh was anymore. They didn't see him anymore in the apartment. They looked all around it, didn't see him. They opened the front door, they looked outside, he wasn't there. They just assumed he had walked back to his home. About an hour or so after that, those friends leave the party and they head back to their place. One or two of those friends who, who went with Josh, they later, when they got back to their own apartments, they would try to call Josh at his apartment, but he didn't answer. And according to Josh's friends, a lot of them would say that that was really, really unlike him. If he was at a party, which he went to several of them, every single time, if he was leaving it, he would tell people, hey, I'm leaving, I'm heading home, something along those lines. But he did not do that in this case, at least according to the people who were there. There were, I guess, a, a, two people who knew Josh and rec you know, would recognize him if they saw him. They saw Josh sometime around midnight, maybe a little bit after, walking on a paved road away from the Metancourt apartments. This would have been on his way across this like bridge to his own apartment. That was the last confirmed sighting of Josh ever. Josh never made it to his apartment. He never, well, at the very least, he never used his card to get into it, which it, that was needed to do that. So the fact that Josh never made it to the apartment and people saw him leaving the other apartment where the party was, something happened between midnight and, well, they don't really know the exact time frame, but something happened to Josh. He is just, he disappeared, he's gone. About two o'clock in the morning is when his roommate Nick would leave Katie's apartment at the party that they were at. And he arrived home sometime around 2.45 a.m. When he got home, he noticed because Josh's door was open, Josh was not in his bedroom. Josh was not in anywhere in the apartment at all. There was no sign that Josh had gotten back that night. This was back at a time when we were using AOL Instant Messenger. And so that's how, you know, a lot of people communicated. So Nick had tried to uh, contact Josh on AOL or AIM, and he noticed that Josh's account was in idle mode, and it had been in idle mode for about 12 hours. Josh never showed up to the mock trial that they were supposed to be doing around 2.30 p.m. that afternoon. At 3 p.m., once Nick you know, found out about this, he calls Katie and says, hey, have you heard or seen from Josh? She said, no. Katie knew Josh really well. I mean, they had dated for several years. And when all of this kind of began to surface, she just felt in her gut, something was wrong. Something happened to Josh. Um, this is not like Josh. Josh wouldn't just, and his parents would say the same thing. He's not someone who just says, you know what, fuck it, I'm leaving. And he just picks up and goes without anything because his all of his stuff was left behind. His identification, money, all that. His bank account's never been touched. He did leave behind his glasses, he did have contacts, which they confirmed were not, his contacts were not in their case at his apartment. So they 
figure he had them on, but he didn't have any of the stuff he needed to clean his contacts. That was all at the apartment. Again, his glasses at the apartment. So at 11.42 p.m. that night, Josh is reported missing. The Stern County Sheriff's Department there, they get to Josh's apartment. They do a very cursory search of the apartment just to see if there's like any notes, like suicide notes or notes of, hey, I'm just leaving. They look to see if there's anything kind of in the outward appearances as a bedroom that would indicate where he might have gone or what he might have done. And that's when they find all of his belongings and they're still there. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Like there's no sign of a struggle. There's no blood or anything like that. His TV was on. It just, it just looked like a college room, you know? But the sheriff's department was like, it's not, I mean, it's not uncommon for a college student to just sleep at someone else's apartment. So that's probably what happened here. Uh, and so they kind of just say, let's just, we'll, we'll wait and see. And they did that and nothing happened. He never came back. And so finally, they began to treat this like a missing person's case. They bring in uh, scent dogs and they try to pick up Josh's scent. So the scent dogs would pick up Josh's scent at his you know, apartment and then it picked up his scent near where the party that he was at, where they picked up the scent there. Then the dogs take them to kind of the middle ground where Stump Lake is located, which is that body of water between both apartments. And the, the scent dog kind of stops right in the middle of the bridge. So there was this initial thought, he was probably drunk and he fell into the water. So they begin a thorough search of the water. They bring in divers, they bring in everything they can. They actually uh, take a lot of the water out. They search it top to bottom, nothing. They find no sign of him, no body, no clothing, nothing. And this is one of those things where he couldn't have been washed out to like the beach or anything out in the ocean. If he was in that lake, they would have found him and they didn't. They spent a very long time with the assumption that he had fallen into some flake because he was apparently drunk. They were really uh, like lasered in on that. And when they were doing that, they really weren't kind of branching out at that point, looking down other leads. And that really kind of began to upset his parents. Looked to them based on the scent dog that Josh was in the middle of that bridge and possibly somebody picked him up and he got into a car and that's why the scent just completely dropped. But the search continued. They searched uh, the campus. They searched uh, the entire surroundings of the uh, Stump Lake. They brought in volunteers. They had his family, his friends, students from the school, all involved looking for Josh. They looked through the water again. They looked through all the wooded areas. Nothing, not one sign of him at all. They even brought in helicopters. They were searching uh, wide areas to see anything, nothing. At some point, the FBI became involved and then there was this possible link to these other young men who had disappeared in that area and then were later found dead in bodies of water. All of them were kind of, they looked like Josh, all young college age students, white males. And so there was this idea that maybe there's a serial killer going around, uh, but they never found any definitive proof that those cases were linked and certainly not that Josh was connected to them at all. Josh's friends and family began to really investigate this on their own as well. And they began to search on their own time as well. Josh's parents were pleading the sheriff's department, like you guys need to do more and more and investigate other aspects of this and stop focusing just on the water. And then the family brought in their own investigator who then brought in their own bloodhounds to search. The bloodhounds, did the same thing. They detected Josh's scent at the uh, the Met and Court apartments where you know, he was. They picked up his scent at his own apartments. They picked up his scent near that middle portion of the bridge by Stump Flake, but it also picked up scent in one more location, at a place called St. John's Abbey. St. John's University is a religious college and St. John's Abbey is part of the grounds. And as a matter of fact, if you're on that bridge looking over Stump Flake where Josh was seen by those two witnesses, if you look down, you can see the Abbey from it. That exact same time frame that Josh disappeared, there was a big scandal at the Abbey. A whole bunch of monks were involved in sexual abuse allegations. There were a bunch of lawsuits filed. A lot of victims came forward. And this dated back all the way from the 1960s until the time 
that Josh's case occurred. And this was on the news at the time Josh disappeared. Josh was very noticeably angry at this story. He, it made him mad that this was happening, that, that these allegations might be squashed and that nothing will happen from it. He wanted these people to pay for the crimes they may have committed. And his friends and family would both confirm that Josh was irate over this scandal and that he was worried that people were going to cover it up. He wasn't directly involved in it to anyone's knowledge. It just made him mad. And it's, some people believe that at that point, Josh was then working on, an, on a, uh, a research paper with regards to this scandal. And he was researching it and he was looking into it. There were also a lot of monks from that abbey who also lived in apartments right near the abbey and the school. So at that point, the police, the sheriff's department, wanted to get a warrant to bring the scent dogs into the abbey. And at first they weren't allowed to. And the abbey wouldn't let them. But then they got the necessary paperwork done. They got the warrant and they brought the bloodhounds in. And they did pick up Josh's scent in the building or near the rear of the building. But the sheriff's department would state that these types of bloodhounds, ones of the, that was used for this particular search, they're not always reliable in that this particular dog apparently wasn't certified. So the sheriff's department kind of just went, the whole Abby thing, they kind of went, meh, it's probably not that. There is that belief that Josh, who was irate over this scandal, who was writing a research paper, he may have gone there, possibly talked to some people, Maybe they people felt that he got too close or he was being too invasive. You never know. And maybe saw him walking home that night and did something. It's a possibility. And scandals of this nature, especially if it's going to involve murder, they can cover them up like experts, basically. And so as more time goes by, they actually end up conducting more searches of uh, Stump Flake. Still find nothing. They conduct searches again over the years of the surrounding wooded areas. Again, nothing, not a single sign of him anywhere at all. So the theories that were floated out there, one was that someone knew Josh did something to him deliberately. Police were told about a time where Josh and Nick had gotten into some kind of verbal argument. And this actually happened just before, like the night of this disappearance. And the argument, according to the witnesses, involved Katie, who Josh had dated for years, but recently they broke up. And then there's this rumor that Nick and uh, Katie were possibly dating, which they both said, no, it wasn't happening. There was just speculation. Again, this is not confirmed, but just speculation that Josh was upset that his best friend, Nick, is trying to date his ex-girlfriend that he just, they, they just broke up. Could that have led to something? When police ask him, he says he left Katie's apartment at 2.30 a.m. His key card was used to access the apartment that he and Josh shared at 2.42 a.m. However, when police talk to Katie, Katie tells him something a little different. She says Nick left her apartment at 1.30 a.m. And because there is about a 10 minute drive at that time of night, they determined that there was about an hour's worth of time that Nick was technically unaccounted for. Police asked him, will you take a polygraph? Initially, he agrees, but then he says, "Never mind, I'm not going to do it. They thought that was strange. They thought that was potentially the sign of a guilty person. But Nick, who's also involved with this mock trial thing and potentially becoming a lawyer, knows what damage a lie detector could do because they're not reliable. They're not inadmissible in court. And so, those things can give you false positives and he knows that and so he didn't want that to linger even if he didn't do anything with the, the test said he's lying that can put a whole new thing on him which i understand i've seen cases where lie detectors were completely wrong it happens all the time it's uh, it, it implies guilt even though it's wrong that can ruin someone any no matter what but nick was like i had nothing to do with what happened to him he was my best friend I would never do that. And he said that police were going in the wrong direction if they were looking at him. Katie said, she goes, I, there's no way Nick was involved. Uh, and she even said, I think police were 
looking at Nick for too long um, and that it was wasted time. For whatever reason, the police didn't interview people at that party, the poker party, until weeks after the disappearance. And these are young college students who are well on their way to successful careers once they graduate. And what the Sheriff's Department and police could get from that is all of these young kids had a bright future. They had a lot ahead of them. And so getting caught up in a potential foul play scenario, maybe even a murder, even if they're not involved directly, but like ratting someone out, like it could lead them to a path where that future for them is gone. And so they do believe that those party goers are withholding information, that they're not saying everything that they know. But there was somewhere around 12 people at that party. And if something happened to Josh in the apartment at the party, someone had done something to him there. There's no way that 12 people would have said or stayed silent about it. Well, maybe. Katie and and, and Josh's family do, do think it's very strange that people said they saw Josh guy get up from the, from the table and walk towards the bathroom, but he never said anything. And that nobody really questioned where he was after that for some time. And so there is that speculation that those people know something. And it could be something that they overheard that would have led to whatever happened to Josh. Did somebody else leave that apartment and nobody's saying who that person is? Was there a fight or an argument? No one is saying. Now, police did not look at Josh's computer for quite some time because they felt that their investigation was going a different path, that his computer really wouldn't yield any anything relevant. So... A long time later, police took the computer and they began to look at it. Well, they found something really interesting and this would have been beneficial, especially if they had looked at this computer right away. Somebody used something called an internet washer, a program to wipe and clean out all of the internet history on a computer. And this also included a file compression software to get rid of certain files. The interesting thing is that that program, because it tracks every millisecond it's used, that program was used several days after Josh disappeared. So somebody went onto his computer and deliberately tried to erase the internet history and certain files from that computer. It wasn't Josh. He was already gone. Who did that? And that thing, that internet washing thing program had never been used on that computer ever before. That was the only time it had ever been done. However, it does not erase everything. They still had some search history. So someone after his disappearance used that computer to search Amber Alert for Josh Guimon. They also searched the term America's Most Wanted. Uh, computer, uh, the guy who was analyzing all this computer data could tell that there was some sort of USB device connected to it at one point, but they don't know what files were transferred to that USB device. But again, this was done after Josh disappeared. That room, his bedroom, was not sealed off by police. It was not a crime scene. So anybody could have gotten to that room and done anything on that computer and done whatever the hell they wanted to. So fast forwarding to 2008, technology for computer analytics is a little more advanced. So they take another look at Josh's computer and they realize that that internet washing program, like I said earlier, doesn't delete everything. And they were able to pull some internet data other than search stuff from that computer. And this is when they began to wonder, did Josh have secrets? Josh had been using Yahoo personals for some time. That Josh had created three separate profiles. One basically using his name. He created two accounts pretending to be a woman, a female, and that they were able to pull up the fact that he was using these profiles as pretending to be women in uh, chat rooms like Yahoo chat rooms, AOL chat rooms, uh, and he was talking to men pretending to be a woman. And a lot of this was done in the middle of the night when everyone else was asleep. And they were, they were able to determine that the conversations were at times sexual related. It indicated that he was talking to a wide variety of men, straight men, bisexual men, and gay men. They found that he had been looking at pornography, and it, it ranged from heterosexual to gay porn. They, I guess, found evidence that he had been using webcam chat rooms. He was uh, trying to find heterosexual couples to webcam with. 
They were able to find out as well that on October 28th, 2002, Josh had reported someone for violating Yahoo's chat terms of service. And then at that same time, he had made a 28 minute phone call with an unknown person or to an unknown person using a phone card. And then after that, he deleted the Yahoo chat program altogether. So the big question was, what was Josh doing? What was he hiding? Was he gay? Was he bisexual? Was he trans? You know, everyone in his life, especially Katie and Nick were like, there's, there was never indications that Josh was gay at all. Nothing along those lines. People just, they weren't believing he was, but he was posing as a woman talking to straight men. Um, oftentimes in sexual conversations. He had been looking at heterosexual porn, but also gay porn as well. Believe you me, um, you know, I could speak from personal experience. It is easy for a lot of people to completely hide being gay from others. It's something that a lot of us, were, we had to do. That it would be shocking if someone found out, you know, we were gay, it would, would shock them. So that doesn't mean that Josh wasn't, because they didn't think he was, it doesn't mean that he wasn't gay or wasn't having conflicting issues with his sexuality. Maybe he was bisexual. So there is that theory that did Josh talk to someone in one of these chat rooms posing as a woman? Did that man who he was talking to find out he was actually a young college student and a guy? Maybe that person did something. Maybe that person got so mad, found out exactly where Josh was, stalked him and then did something to him. That's also a possibility. So there's an area, I guess, near all of this that was known as like a hookup spot where cars would kind of park where you could hook up in a car. And there were two incidences before, like in the days leading up to Josh's disappearance, where witnesses saw this little orange Pontiac Sunfire car parked in that kind of hookup spot. One of the life safety services, which is a I guess the security team on campus had tried to see what was going on in this orange car. And at one point in the passenger seat, a young college male, they didn't really get a good look at him, got out of the car and ran away and they couldn't find him because it was dark. And then the guy driving took off. That was one story. The other story was that these life safety services, security people talked to the person, found out, you know, was able to get to the car and talk to the passenger in another incident. And but that person was never identified, nor was the driver. Well, they finally found out the identity of the driver of that vehicle who would not say who the person was that was in the passenger seat in these instances. But he did say that it was someone he was just dropping off on campus. So when police were like, okay, well, we want to search that car. We want to search it forensically. Just because maybe that other person, that, that unknown male was Josh in other situations. And maybe this third time, the same car picked him up and then something bad happened. Could this, could he have left the party discreetly because he knew he had a prearranged meeting with someone? Well, when police finally tracked down the whereabouts of that orange sunfire, it's gone. Not just gone, gone, it's crushed. It's completely destroyed. Then they would later find out that um, someone had accessed Josh's computer between 11.52 p.m. and 12.32 a.m on the night of the disappearance. And this was at a point when Josh was confirmed at the poker party and Nick was confirmed at Katie's apartment for her party. Police also kind of just said, very possible he made himself disappear. And because maybe he's wanted to start something new. Everyone said that's just, there's just no way. Um, and of course we as loved ones of, you know, victims, right? We're gonna wanna say that. We're gonna say that's just not possible. But you don't really truly know a person most of the time. That being said, he had a lot looking forward to. He had, he was going to law school. He was going to, really looking forward to having a law practice. He was looking forward to becoming a senator or a congressman or the president of the United States. Everyone believes that right now today, if he was still here, he would probably be president or running for president. So there is the theory that he made himself disappear and he did so really, really well. But his image was all over the place. His image is all over the news. It was a national story. And eventually Unsolved Mysteries, the new the new ones would cover this case. And so, and that was, a, I think a year or two ago, his image is out there and still there's no confirmed sightings of Josh at all. So this idea that he made himself disappear and that not one person can say, oh my God, this is him or that's him. I saw him. 
that really does make you think something bad happened to him. The other theory is he accidentally fell into the water because he was allegedly drunk. No one could confirm if he was or not. But again, they searched that lake very thoroughly, multiple times. They searched the surrounding areas. N nothing, not even a freaking shoelace or a shoe was found. Like, he was not located. There's the theory he met with foul play, which could branch off into multiple facets. Was Josh and Nick in a heated argument about you know, Nick possibly dating Katie. Did that lead to a confrontation? Why didn't Nick not tell the truth about what time he left Katie's apartment? Where was he for that hour? I'm not at all, like, accusing him or blaming him. I'm just, these are just the theories, right? But they don't have any evidence that he did anything to him. That's the thing. He has been cooperative for the most part. Um, he has done interviews, talked about this case, and there's just no evidence that he did anything to him. And then you have that theory of, his secret life, possibly. What, is, what was he involved with in those chat rooms? Who was he talking to? Did one of those people find out who he really was, that he was a guy posing as a woman? And maybe they arranged a meeting and they found out then he was a man and that caused, you know, a crazy uproar to happen. It doesn't sound like that's really, a th like, it could be, that they, could be that they found out he was really a man. I don't think Josh would have set up a meeting with a straight man posing as a woman online and then just show up as a guy. Like, I don't, there's no, I don't think he would have done that. So it sounds like the person may have found out beforehand, before Josh could say anything, that he was actually a dude. Maybe he was talking to women online as well. Maybe one of those women had a husband who like found out or something, you know? It seems to be that online activity is what kind of became the heart of this case. What was that about? Is that the motive? Is that the reason? Did something happen in that chat room space that led to this? Well, they also recently have released a series of images that they found on Josh's computer. This is just a whole bunch of different men. And these are the images of, of those men that they found on Josh's computer. They have not been able to identify any of these men. It also needs to be stated that most of, if not all of these men, likely had nothing to do with what happened to Josh. But there is a possibility that one of them may have. Were these straight men that he was talking to posing as a woman? Were these gay men that he was talking to as potentially a bisexual man himself? Or gay man, you know, who knows? Who are these men and why were they saved on his computer? That's a mystery. Who was the uh, orange Pontiac Sunfire driver? And uh, who was his passenger? Was that Josh? Was there some sort of love thing? Was there a hookup thing that maybe, oh, I'm gonna out you because, you know, maybe Josh was gonna, was gonna out someone or maybe that someone was gonna out Josh or who knows, you know, it's like there's so many possibilities in this case that could have happened and they are really not close to knowing what that something is. They know Katie had nothing to do with it because they can say with certainty where she was the entire time. There is only a one hour window of time where Nick was not accounted for, but that's a very small window of time for him to get into his car, drive, and just so coincidentally run into him on the road, Josh, and something happens, like that seems random. Maybe Josh got back to the apartment with Nick because Nick did use his card and so therefore Josh didn't need to use his card. And that's why it wasn't registered. Uh, they didn't find it. I don't think there was any cameras in that building. So did Nick let Josh in and then something happened? There's just a shit ton of possibilities. And that's the problem is there's so much. There's so many ways this case could have gone. It doesn't sound like he went into that water though, because I mean, they searched that damn thing for a very long time, multiple times, nothing. The dog scent definitely indicates that he had stopped somewhere on that bridge and then that scent just stopped. Did he get into the car with someone? Did that person who was in the car take him to the Abbey just down the road, which is where the scent was picked up again and something happened there? Well, did someone from the Abbey find out that Josh was doing a research paper and was maybe gonna release more information and that, that Josh needed to be silenced? You know, it, it, that's the thing, it's just, there's so much. Somebody somewhere out there has got to know the truth about what happened to Joshua Guimon on that night in 2002. Someone at that party has to know something. Someone at the Abbey who was there at that time, they might know something. Someone who lives at Josh's apartment building 
might know something. Someone somewhere out there has got to know the truth. And perhaps that someone is you. If you have any information about the mysterious disappearance of 20-year-old Josh Dimon on November 9th, 2002 in Collegeville, Minnesota, please contact the Sheriff's Department at 320-251-4240. If you know anything, please come forward. You can do so anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. So please help bring Josh home to his family. And please, if justice needs to be served, please help Josh and his family get the justice he rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Maruni, Dooney, Dingleberry, Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. This is a longer one today. As usual, if you are new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube, so please subscribe and give the video a like. I also tell shorter form true crime stories over on TikTok. You can find my TikTok link in the link tree, which is in the description of the video below. You'll also find my case list in that description or in that link tree and uh, just scroll through the case lists. It's alphabetical. If there's a case you want me to cover and you don't see it on there, send me a quick email. My email is listed below. Just the name of the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add that case to my list. I pick my cases at random. I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. That is it for today's video, True Crime Errors. So until the next case, ta-ta for now.